All right, so welcome back everybody. Again, Boris Aratia with GSA, uh, DFO for the GAP FAC, and I'm excited to get started in our policy and practice subcommittee meeting today. So we are in our back to school uh, mode here, and uh, we're just about uh, wrapping up August with uh, policy and practice. So looking forward to some good discussions today. I wanted to first do a roll call here before we get started and then uh, we'll keep going. So let's go ahead and what I'm gonna do is, since I can see your great faces here on the screen, I'm just gonna call your name and then Dave will put a check mark. So we have uh, Luke, uh, David, Kimberly, Richard, we got Nigel, Mark, Amlin, uh, Nicole, Anish, and we may have a couple other folks joining in later. So again, welcome everybody. Uh, for those of you who join us to observe the meeting, so welcome to our policy and practice subcommittee meeting. So we're going to be having discussions. We're gonna make some space uh, later in the meeting for you to submit some comments or if you wanna come off mute and, and make any comments on any of the things that we're talking about, that would be great. So I am going to pass the baton to uh, Luke to get us started here. Sure. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, today, as Boris said, marks the end of the summer for most of us. Many of us are on vacation already. Uh, I know my kids are going back to school next week. The lazy days of great weather uh, are going to conclude soon, and we're going to kick back into high gear. I think that very much applies to the, the work of this subcommittee. I am personally beginning to feel the, the pressure of the clock ticking for us to land. It's a meaningful recommendations uh, by the November 16th meeting. We have public meetings on September 28th and October 26th. Uh, we do have the talent. We still have the time and I'm optimistic we can deliver several recommendations that will be as warmly received as the single use plastics was. Uh, and with that, I think we'll hear today uh, a report from Richard Butel on the PFAS task group in progress. On tech tools, we are at a bit of a crossroads, uh, which we'll talk about later. Nicole and Anne's uh, acquisition workforce committee subcommittee have been working in earnest on some of the same recommendations we had been discussing uh, in this subcommittee and task group. Acquisition workforce is, is well on their way to putting pen to paper to address what tech gaps uh, are from the workforce workforce's point of view. So we'll talk about today, hopefully, and come to some conclusion how we might be able to distinguish what this uh, subcommittee can and will do going forward uh, and what we can do to differentiate or contribute to the acquisition workforces uh, tech tools initiative. Um, I've also set aside some time uh, to take a look at some of the prior recommendations uh, and discuss other potential recommendations that we can potentially pursue in a in our 60 day sprint towards November. I have some ideas myself I'd like to share with you folks. Uh, I've also started reaching out to some of you individually to get your feedback and see how things are going. As always, let me know uh, if you have any ideas on how we can improve things. Um, you know, this is this works a lot better. We've got some brilliant people here. And so, you know, don't keep your observations to yourself. Let, you know, let us know, let me know. No egos here. We're all working towards the same outcome. You know, come November, we want to deliver as many robust recommendations as possible. Uh, and for all the cycles after that. Richard, my friend, you want to take us through uh, PFAS? Let us know what, where, and what's going on. Sure. So we've had a number of discussions um, about some ideas in terms of bringing PFAS into our uh, remit here um, and uh, uh, have pretty much concluded or, or completed uh, a, a review of the literature uh, going forward. Uh, we've had a number of briefings uh, that uh, have been extremely um, uh, thorough and, and enlightening in terms of uh, the background of it. Uh, and uh, where we have landed, uh, and this is my opinion, which I've not had an active dialogue or, or debate with, with the other folks that are interested in this is uh, that we remain uh, uh, somewhat uh, unclear on the scope of, uh, of what uh, forms of prohibitions or what forms of, of, um, of, of acquisition policy recommendations should be made in the PFAS space because of 
not confusion, but ambiguity regarding what is PFAS and the scope of it. Uh, uh, folks with uh, uh, scientific and engineering backgrounds uh, uh, like David and others um, have raised issues about how do we uh, define uh, what we're talking about in terms of PFAS prohibitions and the like. Um, as a lawyer uh, and in further uh, thinking about this process, there is a fairly easy way uh, we could implement this as a matter of acquisition policy. Um, and that is to coattail off of the, uh, the pending federal uh, notice and, and notice of proposed rulemaking on sustainable procurement, which seeks to streamline um, and, and uh, redo um, uh, the federal acquisition regulation uh, uh, to bring all of these under one umbrella uh, going forward. And what, it contem what that notice of proposed rulemaking, which is uh, comments due in early October, uh, talk about um, uh, is uh, a, a re realignment um, of, of the FAR provision, FAR Part 23, um, and uh, to the extent it, it takes a route that we could leverage. Specifically, uh, uh, while it seeks to rationalize the structure of, of, of FAR Part 23 in a very specific fashions, it gets rid of a number of uh, express um, uh, agency certifications and uh, ecological certifications, specifically the EPEAT program, and just and simply says that uh, uh, this uh, uh, procurement uh, federal sustaining policy should apply to any uh, certified um, uh, GSA certified um, uh, product or uh, service. So, in other words, if you have an Energy Star, if you if you have one of these acknowledged and accepted certification process, it will roll up under FAR Part 23 and you don't need a specific acquisition uh, regulation to address it uh, because it will then uh, go forward under the broad umbrella of, of how to drive sustainable procurement uh, uh, practices under this revamp of FAR Part 23. So what does that mean? Well, if we were to simply come up with a scientifically and chemically uh, valid uh, uh, definition of PFAS and, and have it adopted, then the implementation mechanism uh, under federal acquisition policy would simply uh, coattail off of FAR Part 23. And so you wouldn't need to rewrite procurement techniques or procurement procedures per se, but you'd simply leverage the revamp that's ongoing under that notice of proposed rulemaking. So um, I know this is a little arcane uh, for those of us that are procurement nerds. Um, that's where I'm coming from. I've got my procurement nerd hat on, uh, but that is a, a simple way um, that we might seek an end goal um, to this PFAS prohibition. But the challenge is, to my understanding, and this is where my Peter principle comes to a crashing halt, is the chemical, the chemistry of PFAS and the various categories and types and, and how that should be defined, because that issue has been raised by folks that have, are, are, have more of a scientific or engineering background than I have. So, so that's what I, um, that's where, where I'm kind of landing in terms of thinking about this uh, uh, through the course of our meetings. Thank you, uh, Richard. And, and obviously any, this is the point where we should engage in conversation and feedback questions. I see Dr. White's got her hand up, uh, go for it. You're on mute. First time today, I get to count myself lucky. I think Richard, you raised kind of the crux of the challenge, right? Is coming up with a, a viable definition. Uh, I think this is, has been a struggle for a number of agencies to find a definition that is relevant, viable, that is makes sense for all of the PFOS that you would likely be dealing with, right? And also takes in some of the science and consideration. And so I think that we'd have to be really thoughtful about how we develop a definition. I know we've heard from a couple of speakers so far. We'll hear from one later on today. I'd like to also make a suggestion. There is a group within ACC that deals with floral polymers that's been thinking about like definitions as well. Um, and I know some definitions have gone into place at some of the state levels. And so I think it might behoove us to hear, you know, maybe from some of my ACC colleagues on, on some of their thinking there, because they're goal is really to look at how you manage some of these floral polymers more effectively um, and maybe will help us figure out a way to craft a definition that makes sense if that's the road if that's the road we decide to go down 
David. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll just follow up on Kimberly's uh, valid points. M you know, my concern, I'm following this very closely for the recycling industry, is we wouldn't want to make a regulation that has unintended consequences. Under some definitions, certain refrigerants would qualify as a PFAS. And if it said you had to get rid of it or you couldn't use it, that might create complications, let's say, in all of the buildings that GSA manages. Or as Kimberly mentioned, fluorinated polymers, those are used in backings on solar panels. So if those were not permitted, well, that could create problems for things like putting solar panels or renewable energy up in certain you know, buildings or government properties. So we need to be careful about what we do to avoid an unintended, unintended consequence, which will perhaps divert from the goal, perhaps, of protecting people from PFAS that is directly harmful to them. So um, yeah, those are the things that I'm thinking about in that context. Great point. Thank you. Nigel. Is there a way of building in flexibility to directly relate to what David was talking about? So for example, <clears throat> there are certain kinds of refrigerants that were used in old versions of heat pumps that have been now banned and are no longer used, like the, the type of Freon, the Kodak. And so is there a way to put in the same way we would put in for cybersecurity, like it must continue to match the NIST classification. And every time the NIST increases their standards, then it automatically updates the requirements in other places. Is there a way to build that flexibility in? So whatever the new version of safe material is or environmentally sustainable material is, and there's a new requirement there, that it automatically applies to all of these other trickle down areas? Uh, I would offer that the notice of proposed rulemaking discussing this re revamp and restructure of FAR Part 23 does have provisions for waivers um, and and for uh, uh, safe harbors uh, uh, in terms of, of availability and things of that nature uh, uh, in it. So, so there are escape valves in, in, in procedurally in the acquisition process that are uh, discussed in the notice of proposed rulemaking. Richard, David, do you guys have anything uh, you want to put in front of the group for additional comment, thoughts, input as we continue to work through this? I have the NPRM, uh, and I can send the citation around to it. Um, uh, I have it in hard copy in front of me here. So I, <laughs> how I get it in front of everybody using um, Zoom may be a challenge for those of us that are. OK. We can yeah we can figure that out later yeah. we can share it later right um I mean, so we, we i think talked as a group about commenting on this notice of proposed rulemaking uh uh as well so anyway yes i don't know if uh if we want to oh it looks like troy is not here boris i don't know if you want to comment on the yeah, we'll, we'll postpone that conversation, but that's another initiative, Richard, that we're looking into. But the, you're right, the proposal rulemaking has been out for a couple of weeks, and we've been definitely pushing you all to, to take a look. And uh, definitely, as, as individuals, you can comment on those. And, and I will encourage all of you, but uh, we'll um, we'll table that conversation on the proposal rulemaking for, for now. But, it, but I think uh, Richard raised a good point as an avenue that that you can explore for sure. Okay, great. So I think the I think the PFAS task group is going to continue to meet and work through these issues. Uh, Dr. White, thank you for offering. I, I guess they're your colleagues at ACC. Is that the organization that you work for? Okay, yes. well, yeah, they're colleagues that work specifically on fluoropolymers. Terrific. So yeah. I think if it if it makes sense, we'll we'll figure it out and we'll reach out to you maybe to make a connection and and probably have a discussion with them in a, an administrative setting if that if that works for everybody. Sounds good. Thank you. Very good. Okay. So I'm glad uh, Nicole uh, is able to join us. Uh, I know you uh, were otherwise occupied, but have been able to free yourself for a few moments because I think you're a you're a key part of this next uh, conversation. Um, as we we've kind of come to a, a crossroads on tech tools, uh, that task group. I think, you know, we, we tried to bundle a couple of our original recommendations and things that we all heard together as a group uh, related to tools and gaps between uh, SF tool and certain EPA tools. I think there's, you know, the 
we tried to formulate a hypothesis to move forward with. Um, and while we have been formulating a hypothesis and figuring out how to move forward, acquisition workforces, I really identified it as something key for the acquisition workforce and has kind of taken the ball and is starting to run with it. It's really, a, you're going to make it a very prominent in your November recommendations, I believe. And so if I could ask you maybe to explain to the, the group where acquisition workforce is on tech tools, what your thinking is, you know, kind of recap where you've gone. Uh, Cause I think we should figure out today if we can differ, as I said earlier, if we can differentiate and pick a path forward for us so we don't duplicate efforts or figure out how to make our folks, you know, meaningful for your recommendation. So that's the, that's really the, the, the problem I'd like us to try to work through right now. Can you hear me, Luke? I can. You're good. You're good. All right. So um, I, I, from where I sit, I don't see it as a problem. I see it as a compliment and an opportunity for the two, uh, for the two groups to come together um, to the extent that along the way, as we learn more, that there's opportunity for differentiation. I think that, that both the acquisition workforce as well as as this subcommittee has opportunity to, to, to run with what they see. Let me give you a, just a snapshot of where we are on the acquisition workforce subcommittee. We uh, were able with the great assistance from Boris and Stephanie talk with two large uh, panels of GSA folks um, at different stages of the acquisition life cycle. So in August, we spoke with or we got to hear from individuals who are functioning more at the later stages of the acquisition process. So, um, and, and so then we get into issues related to the environmental aisle and SF tool and, um, and GSA advantage. And we heard that uh, one of the primary, uh, the primary sticking points wasn't necessarily the underutilization of these tools, although they are underutilized. The primary issue that they're wrestling with relates to data standardization and poor data. So we could we could create recommendations that suggest, well, we need to amplify these tools. We need to get them out. We need to diffuse them. We need to educate folks. But the feedback we got from this panel was, well, we could do that, but until the data get really good, we're, we're putting tools out there that aren't terribly useful and we can't measure progress based on poor data. Uh, so that was a very, very enlightening panel. Uh, yes, day before yesterday, we heard from individuals that are at the earlier stages of the acquisition lifecycle um, process. So, especially project managers and folks that are involved in uh, category management and contract writing. And I would say they also presented a bit more. Uh, my big takeaway from that discussion was the complexity involved in the process of thinking about quick wins and automation. <laughs> and, and I have to go back to the Jamboard and if anyone, yes. all of this is out there, if anyone wants to go take a look at it, we hear from the panel, we ask them a ton of questions. And then we as a group uh, utilize the Jamboard session where we get our key takeaways and, and put them up on, on the board. As I've been traveling, I just haven't had a chance to step back and digest and, and ask, okay, what are the next steps related to that group? Forecasting ahead, we have uh, scheduled two additional um, sets of individuals to come and talk with us. At our administrative meeting on um, September 12th, we're gonna hear from a, um, thank you, Mark. He's gonna share the, the Jamboard. Actually, you could pop it in, in the chat and, and folks could access it directly. September 12th, we're gonna hear from a startup company that is um, utilizing AI in the contract writing process and is forecasting how sustainability might be embedded in contract writing. He has looked at the proposed uh, bar rules and is going to essentially give us a demonstration of how artificial intelligence might be used. Um, I think that based on what we heard day before yesterday, 
there are a lot of complexities associated with this process. And, and it, I think it raises uh, a few more caution flags, at least for me, as I think about the opportunities for automation. But I think it's also going to be useful from a level setting point of view to help the subcommittee understand what those opportunities might look like. And then finally, we have our next public meeting. We're hearing from folks from um, the DOE PRISM users group. We're hearing from individuals at, and I, I wanna say it's the creators of Doc Scout, which is an AI, um, an AI tool that the Department of Energy is using in, in reviewing contracts. So thinking about how that tool might apply towards the sustainability end. And then finally, we're gonna hear from folks um, in NASA who are using uh, SAS systems and other technology-based approaches towards, automate, towards automation so that we can, again, begin imagining how these tools can apply to the setting of sustainability. In October, we hope to talk with vendors uh, to get their perspective on what this would look like for them. But that's that's the general landscape of where we are. And and Luke, if you ask me how this is going to land, I would say we still don't know yet. We're still collecting data and and assembling the data that we have right now. That's that's great. And, and Mark, I know we're lucky to have you on both this committee and acquisition workforce. Do you have anything you want to add to that? You're on mute, Mark. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thanks. So, but yeah, so some of the things we talked about, and it was really an engaging meeting, I thought, was this this whole concept of of IA, and, or, or AI rather, artificial intelligence to write contracts. And I think eventually you'll have standardized terminology for contracts, but to have the sustainable elements in it along with the FAR would be a good thing. And I think the upgrade on those contracts uh, will help with what we call category management style. And then this could be something that you can uh, use as a tool as well. Uh, the brainstorming session was excellent. And I, I haven't figured out a way to put that in the chat yet because I don't have the link. I just saved it as a document, I think, a cut and snip. Um, the, the states at the state level, I think, is a key in order to experiment with the federal government. It might be a little bit more awkward, but there's some really advanced states out there that know what they're doing and can do it well, and they have been doing it for a while. And I would also include the, uh, the, the European Union and, and maybe even the, uh, the UN. And I'm willing to work with somebody on, on researching that. I, I've got a lot on my plate right now with a new job, and I'm trying to sneak this in, so I'm, I'm doing this over my lunch. But I, I can do research uh, from time to time when I have some downtime, and I'd love to do that with somebody else and, and find out what's going on so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. But the, those are some, some of my ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That, I appreciate that. And stay, stay tuned on that state one. I've got a, I've got a, we can talk about that later. I've got an idea for you. Uh, Amlon, I know there has been a, almost, a, I think you, you have a, a competing view uh, I, I don't, I don't want to say competing, I'll say complementary, complementary view yeah. of the use of technology and tools uh, and, and, and think uh, have a potential different direction where this subcommittee could focus so that we could differentiate between what uh, the acquisition workforce subcommittee is looking at and what perhaps you and Stacy and some of the others that have raised their hands might might be able to dig into in the next 60 days. Amlon? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. No, and it's it's not competing. I think um, uh, I, of course, I couldn't make the Tuesday meeting because I had a conflict, direct conflict at the time. But I'm very glad to hear that you're. You know, I mean, one of one of the things that are, that we are actually beginning to find some conversions on is the complexity uh, of all of this. And I'm very happy that 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 came up at that meeting, because uh, I am not a procurement. I'm not an acquisition. Uh, a geek. I'm not. I'm an engineer. So for for the way we see it, for us, procurement sits right at the intersection of design, construction, and performance. And so all con conversations of procurement uh, are are seen through the view of what are we designing, how are we going to construct it, 
and will it perform the way it will? And sustainability therefore sits in between, right at that intersection of those three things. Which, uh, and again, as I've been thinking with a, a lot about uh, our di different conversations, the other uh, difference that comes to mind from where I'm viewing this is how we view a, who a procurement professional is. And we've talked about procurement professionals. And uh, for us, procurement professionals, or for that matter, contracts, the, uh, I mean, contracts are standard contracts. We already have them in place. AI actually puts out different kinds of contracts that we use. Um, and so there are sustainability special clauses that we, we're working on right now. And honestly, it, it doesn't take AI to write that. So, but where we, you know, where we are right now with some, how these contracts are being written and how, you know, where we're going with all of this is the sustainability or the sustainability slash procurement professionals in our world are usually engineers. And they are, you know, project managers. They're often project managers. They're often, and very often engineers uh, and, uh, you know, are, are in construction, involved in construction management. Uh, materials, uh, materials plays a very crucial role in how we, uh, material science of it plays a very crucial role in how we do our procurement. So bringing all of that together, the, you know, the idea of coming up with solutions which will give, pinpoint something, I will tell you, and this is a field I'm very, very intimately involved in, we're not there yet, not because we need AI tools, because our basic eye, the basic intelligence on it, we're still developing the body of knowledge on it. So where I see, uh, uh, and, and again, this is, I have a few notes here. The other separation I want to make, um, again, as different focuses, is what are the nature of products that we're talking about the federal government procuring? Because the federal government clearly procures a lot of different kinds of products, all the way from furniture, as we saw when we visited the GSA office, uh, to what has been the primary focus of all our policy legislation right now, which is the four major, major uh, I don't want to use the word polluting, but the four major industries that have the highest greenhouse gas uh, emissions is asphalt, concrete, flat glass, and steel, right? So when you look at the procurement of these materials, the, the people who are procuring them, how it is being procured, and what assets they're being used is very, very different from if you're procuring furniture or if you're procuring cleaning products. All of this is, of course, within the purview of the committee. And where I feel like there may be a useful, what may be useful for a little bit of daylight is to treat these as separate because they are, they both deserve importance and they both deserve, uh, you know, discussion. But I think one, like, for example, when we talk about the green aisle, when we talk about GSA advantage, I feel like some of these products and some of these areas are actually in some ways more advanced where yes, an AI tool can be very helpful and it could create that button that could help procurement professionals. I don't see the same thing happening in some, with, with, where, where we are with some of our IRA. Um, with the intentions of IRA, the funding of associated and all the different challenges around it right now. I feel se separating these two out and dealing with them separately would be very helpful. From a policy perspective, I think it would also be very helpful to start with what we already have in policy and try to further that and move further down the road. Now, yes, of course, there are agencies that are working on some of these policy issues. We know what they're working on. These are parts of discussions. There has been a conversation between these agencies and professionals in this field, and we've provided feedback. We understand that, and we have them in our midst as well. The question is, that still does leaves us questions around data, how to develop those data sets, uh, how to make sure that in the long run, as we move forward, uh, you know, this becomes part and parcel of our all our procurement processes. And over the next five to seven years, we can really understand what we mean when GSA, for example, talks about an industry average, right? What is an industry average? What is a national average? What data sets do we have? So I feel like there may be a useful, it may be useful Use, it may be useful for us as a policy subcommittee to look at where we are currently with policy. Where are we sitting? Here is what we already have in policy. We're probably not going to run into rating systems at this point because rating systems, while they're very helpful, much of our policy guidance right now is to use life cycle assessment. It is in IRA. It's there and it's, you know, I mean, this is the direction we're moving in. Our federal buy clean uh, uh, efforts, as well as the buy clean laws that are already implemented in states are using life cycle assessment and EPDs. Are those perfect? Are there places in which we can provide guidance on that? Absolutely, I think, I think that we can. And I also feel like 
overall, when I talk to folks and what they're looking for, I feel like there is a there is a movement towards people are looking for guidance from this committee, not just for our federal colleagues. And we don't want to give our federal colleagues guidance, but really guidance overall in the field, like where should we go? There is decarbonization. There is looking at long-term performance. How do we tie this all together? So um, I, I see Anish's hand is up. So I'm going to let yeah. him jump in. Yeah, thank, thank you. Anish, thank you. Uh, go for it. Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to react to a couple of things that I heard from Amlan and then also Nicole. So Nicole said that at um, their listening session, there was some concern about data standardization. So do we really have like the the best quality of data to make accurate decisions? And that feels like an area that um, Amlan and me and some others on this uh, subcommittee could investigate. And I'm, I'm thinking about it at um, at a little bit of a higher level. So like we don't necessarily have the time or capacity to go into like each individual product category or, you know, you know, because there's so many different um, areas of procurement um, and go deep on each one. But what we can maybe do is offer like a heat map of sorts where we identify which areas or categories we think there needs to be more development or sophistication in the data quality in which areas we don't. Um, and also if there's areas, for example, with construction materials where there's active efforts happening amongst agencies to improve that. We don't we can label that as something where there is a data gap, but it's being addressed. So that way the recommendation ends up being here we, we end up identifying what the like hot spot is for uh, immediate action or next steps to like improve data quality and standardization. So that's that's kind of my my thinking on like what we could provide um, in the in the next few months. Thank you. That's I think that I can visualize that. I think that makes a lot of sense. I'm on what I, 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 I think finish. that's you were you were you, I think that's very similar to what you were describing as well. Correct. And I would I would like to say that I did put together a four point framework with like some as a starting point and what some of those are. And Anish has that email. I think Anish Stacy, some of us kind of went back and forth on that email. And then for a little while we shelved it, but I think it might be useful to start with. I'm not saying that is the answer, but I think it's a good place to start brainstorming from and work around that and say, here are some of the points we have. Uh, and then go from there. And, and the other thing I do want to point out, because, and thank you, Nicole, you really made me think a little bit about like, well, if, if, if you have all this effort into workforce development, what does that mean for us? And honestly, where I'm leaning towards as a recovering academic, we're not teaching the stuff we should be teaching on sustainability in our engineering curriculum. And I think it would be absolutely awesome if this committee could pull that out and say, what are you guys doing in universities? Because we're not doing what is necessary to prepare our, our engineers and also our professional certifications to actually prepare them to be able to participate in a sustainable procurement scenario, which they will be anyway. I think so that might also be another direction to go in. Thank you, Amon. Uh, Boris. Very quickly, I just wanted to, to say when we had the meeting on Tuesday, one thing that struck me is how much leverage GSA has in so much of the spend that goes on because of the category management program. So we have two really important points. Number one, GSA is doing the management for the whole government in the category, the 10 categories. Uh, and number two, six of the 10 categories are managed out of GSA. So we really are in the sweet spot here of, of what could really impact a tremendous amount of the spend at the federal government here, uh, particularly with category management. So I thought we made a really good inroad into the leadership of the category management program at GSA. And I feel like there is a really tremendous opportunity here to, to leverage uh, their power by being able to put things that will influence contracts that impact all of the agencies. It's a very, very complex world we're dealing with. With category management, they're dealing with all the federal agencies and they all have their ways of doing things. So they've been trying to standardize for 10 years. Uh, but I feel like what, what you all are talking about here, uh, there, there's just a lot of opportunities to make a big difference. So just wanted to put that out there. Terrific. Nicole? Yeah, I wanted to jump back to the, to the data conversation. 
I, I think it's terrific, Anish, if, if you and Anlan wanted to dig in a bit more on that and start considering the hotspots. I would really, really encourage you to go back and look at that public meeting video where we heard from experts at EPA, um, because they talked about the complexity associated with the data. And much of it has to do with the fact that the data are collected across different agencies. And everyone wants the standardization to happen, but no one's taking the, the lead. And so I am anticipating that that will likely be one of our recommendations that GSA takes the leadership role and serves as a convener to bring these critical stakeholders together so that a plan can be mapped out. That's, that's the first point on the data. The second, one of the things that Holly Elwood talked about was the data that are that she identified as being the best right now uh, are the data yielded from the Safer Choice uh, program because that program is required. So, you know, when you require folks to collect data, you get better data. And, um, and so it may be worthwhile to dig into that Safer Choice a little bit more to find out what's, what's happening. Um, and and then to step back and because I, as I'm imagining what the hotspots look like, I think everything, each of the areas that you would expect to be problematic will be problematic, except potentially that safer choice. I, I just want to add to that, Nicole, for what it's worth without sounding boastful, but I've spent a lot of time on the data and I can tell you right off the bat where the data sets are. We've done very... Uh, intense data quality assessments. We've published them. And so there is, a, and, you know, again, the safer choice is one area. There's a whole value of other data areas. Again, particularly looking at life cycle assessment where that would be useful. Uh, I would be happy to work with Anish on that. But I mean, we've done a lot of work in this. I mean, we can directly provide awesome solutions. Awesome. Yeah. Let's, let's, why don't we set up our tech tools group uh, to reconvene next week? and map out what that's going to look like and you know the the more work you've done online i think the quicker we can get to how to make a recommendation from it so I, that's that's where we need to get to right the first step is data accumulation understanding and now and then it's analysis and then it's recommendation and that's the quicker we can get to that the quicker we can get back to this group and and with something that they can kick the tires on uh nicole yeah i just want to add one more element to that uh, because that sounds terrific online. I'd encourage you to listen to what Holly says because she talks about the complexity associated mm -hmm. with, with managing those data. And so while we may be able to identify like where the critical areas are to focus, she may add some additional um, layers to it to help think about where we should focus our attention first. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so I think our, our I think we're going to we'll reconvene next week. We'll try to map out the next couple of steps, um, and we'll include everybody who's been interested in tech tools up to this point, and we can kind of you know uh, you know pick, pick our path forward uh, with a goal with a goal towards coming back with some sort of hypothesis at our next meeting. Uh, um, for the last couple of minutes before our guests come in at at four o'clock. Uh, I wanted to undertake a bit of a, a, a creative exercise here um, because I, I think we, I think this case, this group is capable of of doing more, um, and I, I wanted to put the gauntlet out there uh, as I I'll set the context here. I've got a quote I'm going to share. Can you guys see see my screen? Yep, we can see it. Okay. And so this, I can't see it because it's, my screen is on. From spurring the market for recycled paper in the 1970s to making Energy Star a household name, for over 50 years, the federal government has played a leading role in promoting innovation, creating jobs, reducing emissions, and shaping markets through sustainable purchasing requirements. U.S. sustainability purchasing requirements are considered world-class, often serving as a model by other large organizations. The United States Environmental Program, I credit you, Nicole, uh, 
recently categorized the U.S. government's implementation of sustainable procurement as the highest possible status to achieve, noting we're the only country ever to achieve this status. So my question to this group is, how can each of us bring our knowledge, expertise, and perspective to make a meaningful recommendation that'll contribute to a legacy of leadership like this? I mean, there have been times in the history of sustainable purchasing requirements where this country has done things that have, have changed markets. And I think that's, that's the immense weight that I feel on my shoulders when I sit in front of this group and, and try to figure out what direction we should be going in. Uh, so I'm going to ask each of you um, to visualize yourself on November 16th, where you are going to be making a presentation to Administrator Carnahan, uh, Associate Administrator Brumfield, Jeff, everybody, and it's your show. You are a one-person operation, and you're making the recommendation, and you're making the recommendation you were born to make because this, you know, this is the reason you were tapped to be on this committee. You're an expert in your field. You've shown leadership and accomplishments throughout your career, and whatever you're bringing to this committee, you're going to use that to make a recommendation based on your knowledge and what you've learned. So. I'm going to go first before I start calling on people, and I'm going to put up on the screen what our original, uh, uh, the original post-its we put together were. So when I start to think about what my superpower might have been and why I am put on this committee, the, the, the speech I visualize giving on November 16th is one where I have spent the last 60 days taking a look at the best and the brightest of the state and local governments, uh, policies, practices, where there are no policies, practices and policies, where they make sense, uh, sustainable procurement practices and policies at state and local government. Uh, ideally, I'd like to benchmark them, all, all 50 states and major cities. I know that's probably not okay. So I think what, I, what, I'll, what I'd like to do uh, is take a hard look at some of the leading states uh, policies they have implemented, uh, whether they were regulatory or procedural or rules, and really see if we can pull out some creative uh, things that have been done at the local level. Uh, I think what we what we've all seen over the last couple of years is a, a huge amount of of innovation in this space. Right, the state and local level being not as highly regulated as the federal government is really the wild west of innovation when it comes to sustainability and procurement. So in the next, I, I plan to take a look at what's being done at the state level and to try to figure out and navigate with some of our GSA friends, which uh, policies or practices might make sense in the context of GSA and turn that into a recommendation of a few high level points, things we've learned, best practices that the GSA should adopt um, at, moving forward. Uh, so that's, I'm gonna create, a a task group that does that. I'd like Mark to help out. I know he and I both have an interest in this uh, and are both the representatives from state government here. Um, and anyone else that wants to help out as well. Um, a lot of this can be done with just some research. Uh, some of it I would like to meet with and discuss some chief procurement officers of some leading government agencies. But I, that's, that's a task I plan to try to pursue and come back to this group with, with something hopefully meaningful. Um, so, so now that I'm done with my pitch, I would like to reach out to some of the folks, uh, we haven't heard from yet on this, on this meeting. Um, where is Leslie? Leslie, what's your superpower? The microphone is yours on November 16th. You've been working on a recommendation. What is it? Luke, sorry, I joined this call a little bit late, so I'm not able to comment right now. All good. If you want to put something in the chat, that's fine too. Okay. Happy any to comments on any, anything you hear, you want to put you want to put something in the chat, that'd be great. Okay. All right. Then I'm gonna I'm gonna call on some other folks. Uh, Dr. White. All right. For some reason I knew I was coming up next, Luke. I don't know. Um, but I think that you've laid this out really well. I mean, I would say that 
you know, one of the reasons that I'm here is to make sure that we're using science, you know, as the basis of what our recommendations might be moving forward. And I like where you started, which is, you know, evaluating what's been done at the state and some of the local levels, right? And seeing what works, what has worked and what hasn't worked, being able to identify, you know, what metrics will actually help advance what GSA is doing. And so as I think about this, I come back to what our ultimate goal is for this group is really to help them integrate sustainability and climate related initiatives into their procurement processes and being able to help them advance more quickly, I would say, in, in moving forward with, with procurement activities. And so I would say that, like, let's look for opportunities where we can leverage programs that have been successful that we can leverage science and data that will help actually the agencies overall and GSA specifically be able to meet some of their procurement goals. But let's also be cautious that we're not recommending things that are going to have unintended consequences. And I think David raised this earlier, that we really try to focus in on and be thoughtful about the full life cycle of whatever recommendation that we're putting forward, whether that be a chemical specific recommendation or uh, a tool or technology or a best practice that we kind of look at it holistically and that we're providing the best uh, comment and feedback to GSA so that this will be not only a sustainable related recommendation, but that the actual process will be sustainable over time. Thank you, Dr. White. I think the, the GSA wholeheartedly accepts your recommendation. <laughs> Anish, you're up next. Um, yeah, I think two, two topics come to mind. One is I'm um, coming from the building industry and there's been a lot of work on um, evaluating uh, climate attributes as part of, as part of uh, procurement of construction materials and there's agent, the agencies are working on that. But missing from the conversation is like toxicity of materials. So what types of chemicals are in the construction materials? And that's something that in the private sector um, uh, and green building frameworks has been bubbling up. So I think providing um, some recommendations on where GSA can go with uh, non-toxic and chemical uh, or toxic chemical free materials um, uh, could be uh, interesting and um, also is complementary to existing work that GSA is undertaking. So that'd be mine. Uh, I I think that sounds wonderful, and it sounds like the type of nicely curated uh, avenue of exploration that might be meaningful um, and 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 can be accomplished in a short amount of time. Is that something you would actually like to look into? Sure. Yeah, uh, I can definitely um, take that on. Um, with if anyone wants to, to join me on that. It, it basically there's a, a list, um, a, a list of chemicals is called the red list um, that um, has been identified um, from another green building rating system called the Living Future Institute. So there's this like pre-existing list of chemicals and what we could do is um, provide a recommendation on, uh, I guess, ease of screening for those chemicals for construction materials for GSA. I think that would be like the simplest um, near-term recommendation we could provide. But yeah, I can- uh, I think that sounds terrific. Is there is there anybody who wants to jump up and be part of that with Anish? Uh, my hand is up. Yeah, so this is Kimberly. I'd say my hand is up because I, I want to make sure that as we're thinking about this, that we're not just focusing on hazard, but we're actually focusing on risk of those chemistries. So, so yeah, I'd oh, like to be part of that group. Thank you. Thank, awesome. thank you, Kimberly. I, I don't need to be there. You're, you're good enough. <laughs> <laughs> you, say, you saved Amon a job. Thank, thank you, Kimberly. All right. All right. That's terrific. That's really, really wonderful. I'm very excited about that. Um, Mr. Hayden. What do you think? Are you joining me or do you have, or do you, I know you and I are aligned on the, on looking at the states. Yeah, I think beyond the states though, and this is working with the other group and, and Boris, uh, you know, in terms of trying to expand our knowledge of people who are in the know to include the EU and the UN and some of our research, because I think they're uh, quite far ahead of the US. Would love to, I think that's a great idea. 
And artificial intelligence is something that shouldn't be taken lightly. I think there's a place for it. We just have to find out how. Terrific. David, how about you? Thank you. Um, I will say that both Kimberly and Anish said pretty much what I was going to say. Um, so I don't think I'm going to repeat all of it, but certainly having a, you know, a science-based approach and hopefully something that's kind of self-implementing where it doesn't leave a lot to, a lot of vagueness that there's, a, there's actually a direction that can be discerned at, at every moment for GSA to, to move into the future on more sustainable procurement. Um, from next things, certainly from the chemical perspective, I'm very interested in reducing the toxicity of, of materials that are procured. I'm interested in that. And I think my work with the PFAS subgroup um, covers some of that, but I'm also interested in other materials, certainly our, our industry, the recycled materials industry, they recycle paper and metals and plastic. So you know, all, all of those considerations are something I follow pretty carefully. And PFAS is just one manifestation of that. So um, at the risk of spreading myself too thin, I would be interested in those other materials as well and some of the toxicity and safety issues with those. And I think as Kimberly rightly mentioned, you know, toxicity is a function of, of concentration as well, and risk is a function of exposure. So we need to kind of consider those in the mix of, of what we would put forward as, a, as criteria for, for materials. So I'll just leave it at that. Terrific. Thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll add David to that group. Uh, Nigel, how about you? I uh, think I'm going to hold off on this one because I'm still on the technology uh, subcommittee, which I need to engage a little bit more on. So give me a few sure. uh, more meetings on this one. Yep, absolutely. And I, I hate to even ask Nicole because she's already doing so much. Your superpower and what, what hasn't been covered already, Nicole? Um, it is exactly what you and Mark are taking on because I've been studying these states and local governments for six, seven years now. Um, we've done surveys of local governments across the US, but also uh, across 10 different countries. And we have aggregated data that we can pull together to really look at the, the, the um, opportunities for acceleration. One very, very quick place to start, I would say, is turning our attention to the Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council and looking at their membership. These are self-identified leaders in sustainable purchasing. And uh, many of the governments that Mark has put in the chat are, are members of SPLC, but there are others too that, that are worth um, looking at. And then I will also put out an offer. And that is school started here. Well, it's starting out there just now. Uh, it started, well, I said here, I'm in Boston, but in, in Arizona, it um, started three weeks ago. And I have brought on two new PhD students to work with me. And so I have some labor I can allocate to this uh, to help us assemble some of the information that we're looking for. We just need to come to agreement on what that plan is and I'll assign them. Terrific. So we'll include you as a member at large uh, who's going to supply some uh, labor potentially. So we'll we'll try to figure out a, a, a time when we can all get together and map out what the next couple of steps might look like. But thank you. That's great. If you don't uh, like me, uh, mind me chiming in. I do not uh, take that offer lightly. Uh, <laughs> the state of New Mexico was launching a sustainable program and uh, Arizona State University has just been a, a huge element in doing the legwork and the research on, on how that launched. So they're, uh, they're a great resource to tap into. Awesome. Richard, I know you're, you're Dr. PFAS, but uh, if, they, if you can humor me for the visualization exercise, what would you think of, if anything else? Well, I guess what I was thinking when I was listening to this um, is... Again, I come at this uh, from an acquisition policy perspective. I am a I am a procurement nerd to the core, um, and usually uh, the way state and local governments collaborate with the federal government going forward is the federal government opens up vehicles to, for use by the state and locals to to streamline the procurement process writ large. 
there is a, a state group that has the largest centralized buying vehicle in the country. Um, and I'm just having a middle-aged moment about the acronym for these guys. Uh, I think it's, it's NASPO. There we are. That mm -hmm. be it. That's right. It's the National yeah. Association of and, State mm -hmm. Purchasing Organizations. Thank you, guys. Um, I think you, you would want to liaise with those folks um, uh, to talk about process and procedures to, to make this thing work. Thank you. I think that makes sense. I think we might be, uh, uh, we might have some contacts at NASMO. Um, I believe Amlan, who's also spread thin and all over the place, but I'm going to um, humor me for the visual visualization exercise. Haven't it's I spoken moment. enough already? <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything left? Anything left we haven't covered yet? Well, you know, I mean, one thing that, you know, and again, I've, I've been looking at Safer Choice a little bit because, you know, Nicole brought it up and I did look at it since the last time too. One thing I definitely want to talk about, I'll be talking about life cycle thing and all of that and helping with all that stuff. But really, I think the word data gets thrown around so much and almost everybody means something slightly different or even radically different. So like looking at what are all the, you know, as we get to the data discussion thing, one thing that I would like to focus on is like, what are all our, what do we mean by data and where are our gaps? Like, but getting into that, like, for example, safer choice is one kind of data, you know, life cycle inventories are another kind of data, but they're both data in the world of data. So I would like to kind of clarify, you know, like superpower is like, you know, bring that data conversation. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you for humoring me on that. Uh, I think that was very useful. And I think I, think I got to understand you all a little bit better. Um, and we all have superpowers. Thank you for bringing them to the table here today. Uh, it is time for our guests right right on cue here today. Um, Patty and Rachel, uh, is it just the two of you or have you brought any, anyone else? Uh, it's just the two of us. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Great. Yeah, yes. it's just the two of us. Unfortunately, our CEO, Bob Mitchell, was planning to join us, but he took a red eye home from the West Coast last night. <laughs> It's a little bit late in the day for him at this point. Understood. Terrific. Well, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate the both of you making yourselves available. Uh, Patty Dillon, uh, Rachel Simon, Global Electronics Council. Uh, I'll give you guys the mic, introduce yourselves, your organization, and, and uh, take us through your presentation. Great. And do you want to actually show the presentation um, on your screens there? Um, yep, we've got it queued up. There we go. Oh, that is absolutely awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so um, thank you, first of all, uh, Lucas and Boris, uh, for inviting us here today to share uh, with the committee the work uh, that we're doing at the Global Electronics Council. Uh, to address chemicals and more specifically PFAS uh, in our e EP Eco label, uh, which is for electronic products, but we're hoping that some of uh, the way we address chemicals, um, including PFAS, uh, might uh, provide you with a bit of a framework for uh, your, uh, your work that's, of course, more broader uh, than just electronic products. Uh, so, um, I'm Patty Dillon, um, Vice President of Criterion Category Development at GEC, and I'm joined uh, with my colleague, uh, Rachel Simon, who's Senior Manager of Technology Assessment and Resource Development, and she is my uh, chemicals point person. So she's the one who's going to address all the, the uh, difficult questions that you might have about PFAS. Uh, just quickly to tell you where we're kind of going to go with uh, our, um, our conversation today is uh, we first thought that uh, it would be useful to introduce GEC and EPEAT uh, because who are we and why do we address chemicals and PFAS, et cetera? Um, and a little bit about the value of eco labels for sustainable procurement. Um, and then we'll actually go into what our approach is sort of the framework for addressing uh, chemicals of concern in electronic products. Um, and then using that framework, uh, we'll talk about PFAS specifically. What are the drivers for us looking at PFAS and the opportunities and, and really the challenges? Um, and, and 
Rachel will actually be talking about the chemicals of concern and PFAS. Uh, but one thing to know is that right now we're in the process of updating our chemicals criteria. And that update includes uh, PFAS and how can we broaden um, our look uh, and, and, and in fact driving change in the electronic industry as it comes to PFAS. So I just want to kind of put it out there that while our general approach to chemicals is a framework we use all the time, we're actually looking at PFAS ourselves right now. We have different options on the table um, and it's not it's not set in stone yet. Uh, we're still uh, undergoing um, our conversations, et cetera. So just know where we are in the process. We don't have all the answers, but we think we have a framework that might uh, be useful for you. So first looking at uh, GEC, little background. Um, our mission at GEC, we're non not-for-profit um, and our goal is to achieve a world of only sustainable electronic products and services. Now, I'm sorry, we, Patty. Yeah, Patty, I'm so, I'm sorry to interrupt. Where's I? I'm still seeing the slide with both of your faces. Is that oh. what you want? Oh no, I'm sorry. I didn't say next slide. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So yep. Sorry. I'm very very sorry. Okay, so yes. Yeah, so that's the that's the agenda that I just uh, ran through. Now I'm actually. Um, yeah. Sorry. I was looking at a note here. Um, so yes. Yeah, so okay. then this slide is 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 where we are. Um, so uh, for GEC, as I said, mission-driven nonprofit, uh, we uh, embrace technology, of course, because it's so important for um, our, our world and, and our mission, uh, but it's not the, at the expense of people and planet. Um, so we also believe in leveraging the power of large-scale purchasers, both the public and private sectors to drive change. Uh, we were actually founded in 2006 specifically to manage the EPD Eco label. Uh, we've actually grown a lot since then, EPD has matured, and right now we are actually the world's leading eco label for electronic products. Now, what's an eco label? It's basically a tool to help purchasers evaluate and compare, in this case, electronic products. But also, I think really importantly, is that when you have a set of criteria, a very consistent set of criteria, it really provides manufacturers with a direction for design. In our case, it's both the design of the product as well as the supply chain. Um, and then if they meet the criteria, then they're recognized as leaders in sustainability. Um, and so how do we show the leaders? As shown on the slide here, um, we have a registry um, and it allows purchasers to identify products that meet the uh, criteria. And we also have various tools like API feeds, et cetera, that actually the federal government uses uh, so that you can integrate our registries with some of your online tools. So next slide. Um, so here are the product categories that are currently covered by the eco label. Uh, there are six IT categories and you can see them there. I don't need to read them for you. Um, actually, I'm sorry, we're on the, I'm on the next slide. Ah, perfect, great. So these are the product categories that are covered by EP. Uh, there are six IT categories, um, including our largest categories, computers and displays and imaging equipment is also very large, mobile phones, servers, et cetera. Um, our newest product category is photovoltaics. So we now cover PV modules as well as inverters. EP is recognized uh, by the EPA in its recommendations of standards, specifications, and eco labels for federal purchases. Um, Executive Order 1547, um, it actually directs federal agencies to procure products that meet EPA's recommendations. Uh, so we're very well uh, entrenched uh, in uh, federal procurement at this point. And we actually, um, more than 2 billion uh, US dollars are actually spent on EP registered products annually. So that's across the suite of um, uh, organizations that uh, use uh, EP. And that number is actually only the, um, the, the, the organizations that report their purchases to us. There's many more organizations that use EP than we even know about. Next slide. So EP 
is a type one eco label, and I'm not sure um, that everyone here is familiar with eco labels. So I just wanted to kind of give an overview of what some of the minimum requirements are for type one eco labels. Um, it's defined by an international standard, ISO 1424. Um, and when you specify an eco label in procurement, um, you you get a whole package of things. Um, and so, for example, um, for a type one eco label, the criteria have to address the entire product life cycle, from raw material extraction to manufacture, use, and disposal. Um, and in this case, very importantly for electronics, it also should include repair and recycling, getting those materials back into uh, greater, longer use, and getting back into the market. Um, the criteria also must address multiple environmental attributes. So for example, of interest to the federal government, climate and chemicals. Um, and this actually helps address trade-offs. So we're not just addressing chemicals, we actually are looking at a suite of sustainability impacts, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, the criteria also have to be based on science and evidence of sustainability impact. So for the EP program, we actually um, research and publish post uh, what we call a state of sustainability research report that outlines what the, uh, the sustainability impacts are across the life cycle of the product um, and what are some best practices to address that. So for example, in our chemicals state of sustainability research, uh, we actually talk about PFAS. Um, so that's some of the basis for uh, the criteria that are developed. Of course, uh, eco labels represent leadership in the market. Uh, we you know, reference um, existing standards when available, and you'll see when Rachel talks about PFAS that we are referencing some uh, existing standards. We also are required to solicit public comments. So we're not just sitting in a room creating our criteria. For EPEAT, we actually uh, publish our state of sustainability research, put it out for public comment, and then re revise it based on public input. And we also do the same with the draft criteria. So as we're deliberating the criteria, we put them out for public comment. Um, our chemicals criteria that uh, include the PFAS have been out for public comment one time and will go out for public comment again in about uh, October or November before they're finalized. Uh, we have um, eco labels have to have a conformity assurance process so that uh, basically a purchaser of a product that has an eco label uh, has assurances that the product meets the performance requirements. And finally, the criteria have to be regular, regularly updated uh, to reflect uh, evolving science and policy. And PFAS is a fabulous example of where, you know, when we first developed these criteria, say five years ago, PFAS weren't quite on the radar screen like they are now. So we have to constantly be updating um, our criteria. So next slide. Uh, so on this slide, it basically uh, just gives a quick um, summary of uh, how eco labels can make it easy uh, to purchase more sustainable products. A lot of the so-called hard work is done for you. So for example, if you've ever tried to define what a more sustainable, um, uh, what a more uh, sustainable electronic looks like, you know, there's so many issues to consider. Well, our performance criteria, again, multi-attribute, but also we bring in all kinds of stakeholders into our process uh, to help us uh, develop the uh, performance specs. Uh, we have third-party validation uh, where we have, a, we have about eight or so conformity assurance bodies that provide independent verification that the criteria are met. And finally, we have an online uh, registry. Um, I did just see one comment come in about, are we a member of GEN? Yes, we are. Uh, EP is a member of, uh, of GEN, which is the Global Eco Labeling Network, which is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, organization of eco labels. Uh, but on top of being a member of GEN, uh, EP has also chosen to uh, get independent verification, uh, independent um, auditing through ANAB. Um, and so we actually have two sets of credentials uh, for uh, type one eco label. Uh, so sorry for that diversion. I just saw the uh, comment come in. Uh, so next slide. Uh, before I turn it over uh, to Rachel to talk about uh, chemicals and PFAS, I just wanted to show you uh, this 
um, slide here that talks about the four sustainability impact areas that are covered by the EPDECO label. Uh, of course, we're gonna focus on the third bucket today, which is chemicals of concern. Um, and that's um, you know, eliminating the use of toxic chemicals that are hazardous to human health as well as the environment. Uh, but know that our criteria also address climate, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the, uh, not only on the, at the use phase when you're using a product like being Energy Star compliant, uh, but also uh, and very importantly for, um, uh, for greenhouse gases is really addressing uh, the uh, greenhouse gases in the manufacturing supply chain. That's where we're getting the biggest bang for our buck right now uh, for electronic, because uh, that's where uh, up to 80% of the embodied carbon for some products uh, is up in the supply chain. Uh, we also have a, a suite of criteria around sustainable use of resources. Some people call that circularity nowadays. Um, and that's how products are designed for reuse, recycling, making them uh, longer life, life products. Um, and then at the end of life, when they have no uh, function left, making sure they're responsibly uh, recycled. And then finally, the last bucket is corporate uh, ESG performance. Um, and that really is more about the S, the social aspect of ESG, uh, but it's responsible sourcing of materials that conflict minerals, for example, fair labor practices, worker health and safety in this electronic supply chain. So you can see we cover a lot of issues, um, not just chemicals and of course, not just PFAS, uh, but a whole suite of, uh, of criteria. Um, so next slide, well, before I turn it over to Rachel, um, one, next slide. There we go. Um, so before we dive into our approach to chemicals and PFAS, um, it's important to note that EP is a tiered rating system. Um, EP applies to the products, uh, but also we have criteria that apply to the manufacturer or the brand. I mean, that's the manufacturer or brand that puts the product on the market. Um, a product has to meet all required criteria to be EP registered, but then we also have criteria that we call optional criteria. And those are used so that manufacturers can kind of um, move forward, progress over time, um, and they can achieve either sil silver or gold status uh, based on the number of required criteria they meet. Um, and we actually believe that this is one of the strengths of the EP system because it allows us to establish a baseline of performance uh, but then it allows us to include stretch goals, goals that everybody might not be able to meet today when we set the criteria, but they might be able to work towards it and meet it next year. And it provides an incentive and a roadmap of where we need to head, and it drives competition among manufacturers uh, to uh, continue to make progress. So when we talk about some of our criteria, um, we're not always talking about every criteria being absolutely required to be EP, but they might be more forward thinking, um, incentivizing uh, companies to continue to move forward. So next slide. And with this, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel uh, to talk about uh, chemicals of concern, our framework, um, and then more specifically, uh, how that applies to PFAS. Great, thank you, Patty, for providing that background on EP and a high level overview of what it considers. And thank you all for the opportunity to share about the work we're doing um, and how we're thinking about the requirements for PFAS and electronics. Uh, so let's talk about how EP addresses chemicals of concern in sustainability criteria, as well as how those approaches can uh, possibly be applied to PFAS and electronics. So on the next slide, we can see there are three main approaches that we use uh, in our criteria to address chemicals of concern. The first is promoting transparency and increased awareness of the chemical composition of products, as well as chemicals used in the manufacturing processes. Given that chemical regulations are quickly evolving, this encourages proactive management and helps to establish a baseline of communication and transparency between electronics manufacturers and their suppliers. Uh, in the electronics sector, there is an existing standard, IEC 62474, 
um, and IEC stands for the International Techno uh, sorry Electrotechnical Commission. Um, the standard harmonizes declarations of substances and is based on um, whether or not those substances are subject to regulations or are of global interest to the industry for reporting. And then also substances that are specifically relevant to the electronic sector. So that's a great, great resource that we in the electronic sector can leverage um, in this space. The second approach, in addition to the increased supply chain knowledge and transparency is um, in, is to address chemicals of concern in um, restricting or eliminating substances. Uh, this leverages best in class industry practices and leading regulations, such as various elements of EU reach, as well as focusing on specific substances like halogenated substances. And then the third approach uh, that EP utilizes is identifying and switching to safer alternatives. Since the impact of some chemicals is unknown, um, these criteria are focused on evaluating chemicals of concern in key applications, and then considers the impacts of replacements to prevent regrettable substitutes. So those are the three main ways that we consider our criteria um, for chemicals of concern. Uh, next slide. So we're currently in the process of updating our chemical criteria for EP, um, and these are for information and communication technology products, ICT products. As part of our update, uh, we're looking at how we should address emerging issues of concern, one of those being PFAS. And what I'd like to do right now is just share with you some of the approaches we're considering and then some of the challenges that we're facing in that. So through our process, we encountered strong stakeholder demand for action around PFAS and observed that concerns were based off of this um, increased regulation and voluntary actions to restrict them in products, um, which affect uh, electronics manufacturers. Uh, also, a greater demand and efforts by organizations to understand the many applications of PFAS. Um, especially from purchasers, government agencies, and sustainability advocates. Uh, there's also growing evidence regarding the health and environmental impacts of PFAS as a, as a functional class. And then um, at the same time, there are also some data gaps and a greater desire to understand the hazard traits of PFAS and possible replacements. However, one challenge around increasing regulatory uh, restrictions is that policies around transparency and restrictions they're quickly evolving, but not yet aligned. And um, at the last uh, gap back policy and practice subcommittee meeting, John Reeder uh, discussed some of the motivating federal committees, um, uh, the federal commitments under the Biden administration. Uh, in the context of electronics, the industry is also impacted um, by laws pertaining to products. Uh, so, Sorry, one moment. Um, uh, laws pertaining to products. So um, for us, uh, one instance is state regulations in California and Maine. Um, so for instance, in California, Senate Bill 343 prohibits products from being labeled recyclable if they contain PFAS. And Patty spoke about our um, diverse sustainability goals. So recyclability is also uh, one of our objectives. And then in Maine, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with by 2023 products um, uh, are not allowed, which have intentionally added PFAS. And then separately in the EU, um, this impacts our manufacturers. There's a proposed restriction to ban the production and use of PFAS as well. Um, not knowing what the outcome of that is yet, but that that is coming down the pipeline. So on the next slide, um, in the context of our criteria, uh, EP incorporates considerations of um, what's achievable by the industry to highlight leadership and promote progress. So it's not just, you know, pie in the sky ideals, but, but what actually can be achieved by leading manufacturers um, to promote growth in the industry and to promote sustainability um, at an incremental level. 
Um, some of the challenges that we faced in terms of establishing PFAS criteria are the complex global electronics supply chain. Um, with brands who, in anticipation of trying to meet these regulatory demands, they struggle to obtain information and understand the full breadth of PFAS used from all of their suppliers. And then also another challenge is just the ubiquity of PFAS in um, processes and materials. Uh, and so defining the scope of, of what substances to focus on. Um, so in other words, should all potential 10,000 chemicals um, as defined by the structural definition of PFAS be included? Or would a list of specific substances be more effective? And then if it's the latter, a list, um, which list um, would be comprehensive and yet achievable? Um, in the electronics industry, um, to talk about the ubiquity, it's used in, in product components, so lithium ion batteries, wires and cables, in processes for internal components. Um, in the electronics industry, um, it's used as a solvent, as heat transfer uh, fluids, in the semiconductor industry, printed circuit boards, surface coatings, um, for liquid uh, crystal displays, smartphone surfaces. So th they're just used throughout. And that speaks to you know, the complexity of understanding where they're used and, and how best to approach uh, the problem at hand of uh, moving forward and moving away from their use. So going back to the approaches I started with on the next slide, um, we have our first approach um, in thinking about how we can address PFAS in, in uh, EP is um, increase supply chain knowledge and transparency. Uh, a possible goal would be to collect information on the presence of PFAS. Uh, at a minimum, this would consist of identifying the presence of over uh, 600 chemicals that are listed in that standard I spoke about earlier, the IEC 62474. Again, that's um, the standard for declaration of substances likely to be in electronics and based on regulations. And these 600 substances are included in there um, based, uh, they were added in January based on the main legislation. So it's also likely that more substances will continue to be added over time as they're determined to be relevant to electronics um, and, and also if future regulations uh, come through. Um, but also does another list such as the one by OECD or EPA's ComDocs chemical dashboard make more sense um, for us to consider? And then how um, how is the these uh, list of chemicals best served for the industry? Should there be public disclosure about that inventory to help evolve how PFAS can be addressed? Um, or is it really just the manufacturer understanding uh, that information and, and working with their supply chain or around communications? So those are some challenges about the um, knowledge and transparency of collecting inventory data. The second approach, um, to addressing chemicals of concern is restriction or elimination of substances. Uh, so fluorine is considered by some the best proxy for identifying the presence of PFAS in materials. Uh, and thinking about how a fluorine restriction would work for plastic parts, uh, such a restriction might possibly focus on select components, um, include exemptions for essential use, or include allowances of PFAS content and recycled content to stimulate their use. Again, as Patty spoke to, we have these competing sustainability issues um, that are part of the discussion and consideration. So challenges that come up to this approach uh, for this approach is pinpointing um, what the criterion should entail. Uh, again, is um, compete, conflicting compliance obligations uh, such as requirements for fire safety, uh, mandate that some of these substances be included or a replacement for some of these substances uh, that there's just not a safe alternative for currently. Uh, there are also competing sustainability goals such as recycling, which I spoke to, and then how to demonstrate that PFAS aren't in components, including the limitations of testing methods. So is 
is total fluorine a good proxy for PFAS? Is it the most efficient way um, for manufacturers to validate that or not? And then there's also a lack of existing feasible alternatives for the same function, which I spoke to. And then what should be the threshold limit for restriction uh, to move the market? So those are some of those challenges that we're facing in considering a criterion on restriction and elimination. And then the third uh, approach that we take um, using chemical uh, hazard assessments to consider the impacts of PFA replacements to avoid regrettable substitutes. And this is considering select applications um, and applications with feasible substitutes is part of the discussion. Uh, challenges around this approach that we faced in, in trying to define uh, uh, exactly what's in a criterion is the lack of hazard information on PFAS and, and alternatives. Um, while you know there's some evidence that that notes the uh, human health and environmental impacts, uh, there's still not full hazard data available for a lot of these substances. And then do all PFAS have the worst chemical assessment score or in the interim are some performing a little bit better? Um, and then how do we prioritize impact? Is it uh, in terms of what the manufacturers are gonna do? Is it to incentivize any or all efforts is it to focus on industry efforts um, for key substances uh, so that we encourage collaboration and movement as the whole industry? And then um, another option is to focus on the greatest quantity to have the greatest impact or the most frequent use in an application. So again, you know, honing in on the specifics of, of what this would entail is one of the challenges we face with this um, criteria. So, that was a very quick high level overview of um, how we address chemicals of concern, how we are thinking about PFAS and, you know, some content we thought that, you, you know, is food for thought about, you know, potentially leveraging for uh, the task at hand. I did see that there were some questions in the chat. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I cannot believe you have managed to put that amount of material into 30 minutes. <laughs> Bravo, wonderful, wonderful job. Uh, Mark, you've got a couple of questions in the chat and you are uh, there, you're here and present. So if you wanna ask, go ahead, go for it. You're on mute. Thank you for that. The blockchain question was already answered and the global eco labeling network membership uh, was already mentioned. The two that weren't answered yet was if PFAS is used as a plastics mold lubricant or release agent, would the state laws ban its recycling or use? Yeah, that's a great question. So it depends on how those laws are are crafted, right? So in California, that law, um, it, it dictates that it's intentionally added PFAS. So because it's used as a, a process agent, it, it wouldn't be included. But again, those overarching questions of how do you prove it's there or not? And how do you improve the intent of intentionally added? And what, what threshold does that occur at? So, you know, it becomes a very complicated um, question and um, uh, to answer, you know, whether or not it would be banned or, or not it depends on the details of how those laws are crafted. Sure seems to me if it, if it wasn't intentional, it must be accidental. And how do you get there? Yeah, so uh, uh, one of the problems with PFAS is, again, the ubiquity, they're just like used in so many different processes. So there's, there ends up being uh, residuals that, uh, that end up in the end product. Um, and some of those, the manufacturers might have a say in informing, and some of them they're not aware of, and some of them, uh, they, they don't have a lot of clout in the industry. So for instance, um, it's used in, in, I'm sure everyone's familiar, it's used in plastics, but also in a lot of metal processes. And so um, electronics is such a small purchaser of metals as a whole compared to like automotive sector, 
that their clout in the industry is a little less. And so to move um, to move their suppliers to provide information or to move away from a substance becomes more challenging in those instances. And if I, I can add um, something to this conversation about intentionally added, um, I used to work with the Toxics and Packaging Clearinghouse and in their definition of intentionally added, it was about intentionally adding it to the product to give a, a characteristic or function to the product and the process chemicals weren't considered intentionally added to the product, you know, the finished product. Um, so that I think is where some of this, uh, this falls as well. So it differentiates between adding PFAS as a fire retardant on a fa fabric where it's applied or sprayed versus if it's in an injection machine and it's just using them to pop it out. And that could be, I, I don't know the law specifically, but that's kind of sometimes the difference is, you know, is it intentionally added to impart a functionality to the product? So Mark, you yes. had another question too. This is a favorite one of ours. <laughs> well, 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 I'll ask it as so everybody hears it. Why wouldn't total fluorine be a proxy for PFAS content? Yeah, so there are... Um... There are some uses of fluorine that are not PFAS, um, and so they're not organic fluorine. Um, then, uh, so and some examples of that is as a flame retardant additive, um, there's fluorine potentially used, um, but it's not a PFAS. And then, so when, if we use fluorine as a proxy, then that's going to come up in, in the assessment. And then, um, what do you do with that? Do you ask them to prove even further with their supply chain because it, it pinged on a test? Um, but then the flip side of that, again, is also, you know, um, that these issues become so complicated. Uh, EPA did a study that showed that in some instances, um, the addition of fluorine can, can transform into PFAS residuals. And so fluorine perhaps does continue to be the best proxy because it could lead to the formation of PFAS, even though that was not intentional. Thank, Thank you. you, David, I, you had a question? No, I didn't have a question, but you know, this, this is a very interesting topic to me. I follow it pretty carefully. Um, in terms of you know, to the original question, because the definition is usually tied to the, the fact that at least one or more carbon atoms are fully fluorinated, there are many chemicals with fluorine that do not qualify as PFAS from certain definitions. So um, you know, I don't think there's a standard for, well, how much fluorine signal would it take to be confident that what you are testing is a PFAS or not? I mean, it's, 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 a hard, it's a hard metric to use, I think, in certain circumstances. And certainly your, your toothpaste has fluorine in it, and it's fluoride toothpaste. So yes, yeah, not PFAS, but I'm just saying there are materials that have fluorine that are not PFAS, and that's an inorganic one. So, um, and as far as I know, they don't use toothpaste to make, you know, electronics. So I shouldn't be an issue. Um, that was supposed to be a joke. But um, <laughs> I laugh. I laugh. <laughs> it's but it's, uh, it is a tricky yeah. issue. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, uh, the 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 benefit of the total fluorine test is also that it potentially is easier, and so it would become a tiered approach. So you could test for total fluorine. You you know you get recognition of where fluorine might be. Then you do something to prove that it's uh, organic or inorganic, and so. Um, when I spoke about like what's achievable, where the industry is at, uh, part of that is the consideration of cost, um, feasibility of conducting, you know, uh, research or supply chain obligations in terms of understanding content. So uh, tests also have to be uh, potentially low cost or can be or there are enough labs to conduct the tests that they can send them out to. 
um, and also, uh, you know, very quickly go through, uh, they can apply the test very quickly to all the components within their products. So those are other factors that um, come into play when we're thinking about a testing methodology. Thank you. Uh, how about Dr. White or, or Richard Butel? Questions, thoughts, comments? Yeah, this is Kimberly. I think David raised a lot of the things I was going to ask. I guess the only other thing I would raise here is, as you all have been looking at this from, it seems like this is mainly focused on hazard. Have you figured out a way or thought about taking into consideration exposure in any way as you're mm. identifying alternatives? That's a great question. So uh, I, I believe it was in June, EPA um, put forward a position on the semiconductor industry and noted that um, PFAS in semiconductor manufacturing are likely not a priority based on uh, exposure scenarios. So um, the answer is uh, yes, that's part of the discussion of whether or not um, that should come into play in prioritizing which substances to focus in on. Uh, but again, you know, we're in the midst of trying to figure these things out. So I'm um, still not sure entirely how that's going to work out. So one Thank thing you. that uh, Rachel, we didn't mention uh, extensively, but uh, all of our criteria are developed in a voluntary consensus process with multi-stakeholders representing uh, manufacturers, uh, government policy and sustainability advocates, purchasers, um, and other eco-label users. And so um, these deliver, you know, we have people bring in all kinds of perspectives and it takes a while to hash some of these things out. So you're kind of catching us in, you know, we're, we're deliberating all of these things and trying to figure out like, hey, do we just do we prioritize, for example, certain uses that perhaps might have, you know, greater exposure or more prevalence in the industry? Uh, you know, so yeah, so we're really working on all these things right now. And it also speaks to a question when you're talking about exposure, it really speaks to a question of what who are you most concerned about in terms of the impact of PFAS, right? Is it the worker? Is it the end user? Is it the end of life scenario and the emissions into the environment? Um, those might shift how you create a restriction or how you create a criteria um, because you could use more control. You obviously have more controls in the process as, as opposed to say the end of life. So uh, again, that shapes um, how you would approach it and whether or not you would include exposure or not. Uh, Boris, do you have a question? Yeah, thank, thank you, a great presentation. I did wanna bring my, my colleague Adina into the conversation here as we're, we're looking at specific, but I, but I was curious and maybe Adina, you can elaborate on this. I'm, I'm looking at what would you think would be some, policy recommendations or things that we could explore for this committee for GSA, because GSA manages so much of the, the federal procurement process, uh, and they have such a large footprint in terms of how the whole government buys, uh, because we are looking at what, what would be most helpful for GSA when we're looking at it like policy solutions. And I don't know if, if Adina, you want to jump in, because I, I was curious to, to hear the perspective from, from Patty and Rachel on that. Yeah, so I yeah, oh, ahead, can Adina. you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for a policy perspective, um, one of the things that does make it or simplifies the process for the government is to have an eco label to look towards that has already vetted the product. Um, part of that has to do with the eco label product. The eco labels are also overseen by EPA, and EPA actually has the ability to. Um, through the uh, through Tosca to know what is going into a product, um, so you know we have not within the agency we have not uh, adopted any firm policy on PFAS, but we have looked at um, some of 
you know, our requirements for when we buy, for the most part, construction products where we can verify if there's an eco label. So, for example, we've looked at um, the carpeting and upholstery to see if there's an eco label. And then when we procure, you know, notifying um, our suppliers, we want something that has this particular eco label to reduce PFAS. Um, I think kind of what we're, what you know, listening to the presentation and some of the questions and then reading the questions in the chat, I, I think that, you know, information technology brings up some interesting challenges regarding PFAS, maybe more so than, um, you know, building materials or even uh, soaps and detergents. I know also have, um, you know, there's certain uh, guidance through EPA for, um, you know, products that we use in our janitorial services that we've looked at. So I, th I think this is really an area where, you know, there's opportunity to delve into how would we address it because it, these are more complex um, products. The other piece about IT is the supply chain elements of it, where you have multiple suppliers coming forward to put a product to get product together. Um, so I guess like to, to answer your question, Boris, like from a policy standpoint, it's always great if we can point to an eco label to say, well, this is already been vetted. Uh, by EPA and and it doesn't contain the chemical, but for some of these, you know, more complicated purchases, I, I think that's really where you know we're, I'm seeking the the brainstorming of the group to say, well, consider this in in doing your procurement. Yeah, and 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 what I was going with that, if you know, if Patty and Rachel were sitting on this subcommittee, I mean, and you're looking at, we have this amazing agency that really has a ma massive impact on how the government buys. I mean, how how would you they go on like so low hanging fruit or things that you think will have a big impact based on your experience in your in your ecosystem. So one of the things that I because I also um, so I also work on a, a, a larger committee that's on PFAS and products in the government. Um, so I think it kind of depends on the point of view of the agency and the procuring official. Um, I tend to look more towards, well, what can we do to reduce if we're not in a position to ban? Like, so I think that that's like kind of two, I guess, guide guideposts to kind of think of, are you seeking a policy that's looking to completely eliminate something or are you seeking a policy that's looking to reduce it? And then what are the risks and benefits depending on how you set that up um, to have it be, if you were looking at reduction or if you're looking at elimination. And then the other question is, is which one are you going to have more of a successful shot at? And that could be just the nature of the market you're looking at. It could be the nature of the product. Um, I think some of the questions that um, Dr. Wagner was, was bringing up about, well, you know, how are we kind of assessing what is PFAS? Like, what does it look like in terms of the fluorina uh, fluorinated molecule? Um, some of the other questions that came up about, you know, is it intentionally added, is it not? Um, which I found it interesting in the conversation about the different laws that come into play, because um, when I think of intentionally added or, or not intentionally added, I know there was a case study that was done uh, regarding PFAS and pesticides that USDA was looking at where um, they had uh, the pesticides had some res had PFAS in it and it turned out it was never within their manufacturing stream, it came from the container that the pesticide was placed in, it was leaching from the container. Um, so that was completely, that I think the, you know, the term like non-intentional, it was really truly non-intentional because <laughs> it was for them to figure it out. Um, so I think that these are really great conversations to have in the brainstorming, but that in terms of policy, that's, that's, I guess the best advice I can give. It's sort of, what can you do? What tools are available? What are we looking to buy? Um, and I, I think because there's already been some movement on some of the other products I mentioned, um, you know, I think that looking at towards um, information technology because we we procure so much of it, I, I think that'd be a great place to start. So um, I really appreciate the the presentation today and getting some some additional information. Is what do we do about the chemicals of concern? Thank you, uh, Rachel, Patty. Why don't we ask you? Uh, why don't we re redirect? Boris's question to you folks. You were sitting on this committee. Uh, what's the direction you would take us in? So I think what I would look at first is really to look at the greatest uses of it. 
of PFAS? Like, you know, you know, what, what, where, where, where can we not only greatest use, but where can we have the greatest impact? And so, you know, you, and then you can figure out if, if it's already covered by someone else or if it's not. And if it's not covered by someone else, so for example, you might say, oh, well, electronics, that, that, that's where the most, P, I mean, this is not true, but that's where all the PFAS are used. But okay, you can say, well, you know what? There's an eco label. So maybe we could help influence, make sure the eco label is addressing PFAS, but you know, you have somebody covering that. Um, but if you look at something like fabrics um, and, and I know that there's like the, the fabric, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's some organizations that look at apparel, right? Well, are they addressing that kind of stuff? And if not, where, how can you help influence that through your purchasing power? And it might not be through an equal label, it might be through something more direct, like for example, with the federal government and climate change. One of the things that they've basically done is done an analysis of their, the, the, their top vendors by spend. And for their top vendors by spend, they're saying, okay, well, you know, we want you to report your emissions to us, right? So, so they're basically saying you're the top buyers and, and we want to, you know, by making it more transparent, we're hoping that this transparency will make you say, oh, let me, you know, let me reduce it because I'm, I'm in the spotlight. So I think I would kind of look at, at, at uses and where you can have the impact. And then sometimes I think it's going to be a different tool depending on what you've identified. Yeah, and just to piggyback off of that, I, I was thinking along the same lines of um, prioritizing greatest uses and greatest impact. And another layer I would put in there in the impact category is, is industries that are making progress, that are doing the work, that are, are further along. And, um, uh, uh, you know, Adina spoke to formulated products that uh, they're generally at the forefront of green chemistry. Um, Patty spoke to the textile industry. They're doing a lot of deep thinking on um, this topic because of, of coatings and moisture resistance and, and that sort of work. And then the electronic sector, you know, they're, they're deeply impacted by um, these regulations and, and they, you know, want to shift and they're continually innovating. So um, they are looking at this problem uh, very deeply. So I guess the last piece of advice would be what we like to say all the time in our organization Let's not boil the ocean. <laughs> if you can believe it, we have said that many, many times too, but I think that's the, the challenge before us is an ocean that needs to be boiled. So we're trying exactly. our best. You know? Exactly. And, and maybe maybe by picking up some, uh, some success areas, you can have success, right? Um, yep. and, and show progress, yeah. Yes, the largest impact. Appreciate that. Appreciate both of you folks making yourselves available on relatively short notice. Wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you. One, could I add one quick color comment? Absolutely. Go for it. So uh, back when the EPA EAT program was rolled out, I was the supply chain legal counsel for a large hardware OEM. And while we were able to absorb the costs of obtaining the ECHO certification, which were not insignificant, actually running into several hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, many of the smaller vendors in our supply chain simply couldn't afford uh, to, to acquire uh, the, uh, the ECHO label. And so they fell out of GovCon and out of the federal market as a result and, and reduced our industrial base that we could draw upon. Um, uh, and so, uh, I mean, I'm always, I have that scar tissue from days past and I mean, the, there's no free lunch. And so to the extent that particularly the, the standards organizations or the groups that, uh, qu that own these echo labels can, can um, uh, stagger their, their fee structure or, uh, and particularly the EPEAT, the not-for-profit, I think it was in Seattle, that owns that echo label. I mean, they kept growing the scope and, 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 and adding bells and whistles and more and more compliance criteria uh, on it as a as any group has the natural propensity to grow their remit uh, and expand um, their influence in that regard. I mean, there has to be some sensitivity uh, uh, to the direct industrial based impacts of these of these compliance regimes 
and the costs associated, particularly when they, they are, as EPEAT was, a mandatory procurement criteria uh, to qualify to enter the government marketplace. So that's that's a, uh, my soapbox for the afternoon. Thank you, well, we do we do have a, a sliding fee structure uh, based on uh, you know uh, revenue uh, for sure, and we also uh, we do a lot of uh, extra hand holding. Um, so our conformity assurance body uh, basically has a flat fee to help a company, and so the small guys need a lot of a, a lot of assistance and they just provide it. Um, but we actually have our own conformity assurance body in-house because it might be too expensive to go to some of the larger ones where you're not doing a lot of business with. And, and to, thank to, you. To piggyback on that, <clears throat> excuse me, have you guys had any conversations with the, with the SBA Office of Advocacy? Uh, because they would trigger the Regulatory Flexibility Act. So if we, piggyback on what Rich, Rich was saying, if we do something that would have an adverse impact, you know, too much regulatory burden on small businesses, it could torpedo the positive impact that we're trying to have with regards to the environmental and sustainability. It may make sense, Luke, for us to take this uh, conversation and get some input from the Office of Advocacy, because I think you know, preventing that on the front end and how we could address the challenges that smaller businesses would face on the front end would be helpful to us, particularly as we're trying to do exactly what Rich said, which is expand the supplier base and expand the number of companies that want to bring their innovative products and solutions to the federal government. I think that makes sense. Go ahead, Rachel. Looks like you're going to respond. Yeah, and thank you, Richard and Nigel, for those comments. It, it's definitely something that we keep in mind. And you know, as Patty went through the tiered structure of our eco label, that's part of the reason that we have these optional criteria is because we do want to consider small and medium sized enterprises in in bringing them along for the ride. Um, part of what we're trying to do is, is leverage the work of these bigger organizations so that the industry as a whole can move forward. And some of the innovations that take place um, by those that you know have bigger wallets can, can uh, reap benefits across the industry. Thank you, Rachel. I do wanna, we do have to allot some time for our members of the public and I wanna get to that during our, our three to five time frame here. So uh, Boris, do you wanna see if we have any public comment? Yeah, but, but I did want to thank Patty and Rachel. Thank you so much again. You've really uh, given a lot of things to think about for, for this committee. So well done, both of you. Yes. Great. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Can, thank we'll, you. Can both, we'll sign you can off then. Around. You can, you don't have to go. You can stick around if you want. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you and, all. Thank and you. so I see we have Katie and Jennifer um, and then Troy as well, who is our um, committee chair. But this is a, an opportunity if you have any comments. Uh, we will we'll allow some time for that. So we'll go ahead and uh, if there's anything you have, you would like to add, uh, this is an opportunity to do so. And you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Jennifer. Great, thank you. This has been um, a very interesting look into the work that you all are doing. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I manage Surfrider Foundation's Plastic Pollution Initiative. If you're not familiar with Surfrider Foundation, we've been around for close to 40 years with about 230 grassroots chapters and uh, student clubs throughout the United States and a number of global affiliates. So um, I was really interested in the recommendations that came out recently. Uh, particularly section six that had to do with plastics and um, just wanted to say like you know great work on all of that that was done we are very excited to see the final acquisition policy and I did have three questions I don't know if you can get to them in the time you uh, have right so now. so you can ask the questions but we won't be able to answer them okay yes. okay. okay yeah sure so um so what we're hoping to to learn at, and and maybe you can tell me the best way to to find out this information is um, what type of mandates will be coming out of this? You know, um, I know that there's recommendations. Will there also be any kind of regulatory mandates? Um, if you have any idea, like which sections of governments will go first in implementing the recommendations and what the timeline might be. 
Okay. And and I would say if you can send those um, questions, email to the GAPFAC at gsa.gov. Okay. We will be able to, to get them and then I'll pass them on to the members. Okay, so, great. Gap, Thank you. GAPFAC at gsa.gov. Got it. Appreciate your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think, uh, Troy, uh, you're definitely uh, you'd like to chime in or any, any closer I'm comments. I'm here. Can you, I'm here, and hopefully you can hear me? Yep, we can hear you. I'm sorry. I had to, to join by phone today, and so um, I, and I, I apologize. I was in a meeting that went long, so I missed um, – the first hour, but then jumped on and just found that uh, the presentations were excellent. It was a really good um, discussion. And I, I heard from uh, Boris, as I was letting him know I was running late, he said the, the discussion also with the subcommittee at the top of the hour was, was very good as well. So uh, I look forward to going back and, and watching the recording of that. Um, but I uh, just want to say, uh, yeah, just just well done. I I just thought it was an outstanding discussion. It gives us a lot of um, a lot of ideas for um, diving into this whole issue. All right, thank you, Troy. Thank you, Troy. So um, just a couple of uh, closing remarks here before we we adjourn. Um, just administrate. We're just at the top of the hour, but we're going to be. Um, holding a special meeting on September 21st. It will be just a one hour meeting, but this is for the full committee where we're going to be taking on the FAR rule that Rich uh, spoke about earlier in the meeting. So we're gonna look at it uh, in terms of comments and then we're gonna present it to the full committee, uh, have some discussion, deliberation, and then vote on the recommended comments to be made to the FAR Council on the proposed rule. And so we're gonna take that special meeting on the 21st and we send uh, invites to you all for that. And then the other thing is we are um, looking at a volunteer for taking on the co-chair position for the policy and practice subcommittee. Uh, Steve Schooner, he has told us that he just will not be able to serve on the chair capacity due to a new position he's taken on at GWU as a dean uh, in the law school, school law, but he's gonna remain, the good news is gonna remain as a member um, of the subcommittee and the committee at large, of course. But uh, I had uh, sent that request and we definitely don't need to talk about it here, but just a reminder, I would like to hear from you all uh, just in terms of your you're interested in that, and then we will go from there. But I just wanted to put that out there. Um, and then I think, um, yeah, I'll, I'll echo what Troy said. I thought it was a really an outstanding discussion today, uh, both before our speakers and then during our speakers. So looking forward to uh, what's gonna come out of the, the conversations here on August 31st of 2023. Um, look back to you, anything else on your end? Oh, sir, I think I said it all. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate your active participation today. I think we got a couple of new great ideas and a and a path forward uh, on some meetings and some folks we need to talk to. So I, I think it was a great meeting. Thank, thank you all. Before we go, is Troy going to hold an after meeting? Right. So with that, before that, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn this meeting. Uh, so we'll go ahead and stop the recording.